السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ کی اللہ نعمت الاسلام و کفا بہا نعمت آل پریز اینڈ گریٹیٹیوڈ بی ٹو اللہ سبحان و تعالی آن ہز بلیسنگ اف اسلام دس سفائس ایز اے بلیسنگ اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی لائک ٹو ویلکم یو آل بیک وی ار گوئنگ ٹو کنٹینیو آن فرام وی وی لیفٹ آفٹر دی رمضان ایز یو ریکال ان رمضان وی ار ڈن اباؤٹ ہاف آف دا قرآن اینڈ دیٹ واز دی انٹینشن ٹو کمپلیٹ اپ ٹو سورہ بنی اسرائیل اینڈ وچ وی ڈیڈ اینڈ ان شاء اللہ ٹو نائٹ وی ار گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ وتھ سورہ کہاف اینڈ سو دس از نا وٹ وی ار گوئنگ ٹو بی ڈوئنگ از ایگزیکٹلی وٹ وی ار ڈوئنگ پریویسلی وچ از going over the, the translation and I'm going to give the briefest of the explanation just for you to be able to get a sense of uh, you know the the ayahs that are there where I believe that some explanation is needed but uh, the format would really remain the same so inshallah we'll be doing half a para about half a para every time uh, we meet over here and I'll uh, try and co- cover this up in uh, about 50 52 minutes or so so we're going to start with surah kahaf and uh, uh, this is a very interesting surah kahaf literally means a cave and we'll do half of this and this surah was revealed on to our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam maybe around in the 4th or the 5th year, year of nabwi which is uh, which is kind of a difficult year in, in many ways because uh, not much um, uh, you know not much success to show uh, the years these are called the years of harassment and the years of persecution but uh, surah kahf by itself has tremendous virtues and if you see many ahadith on the subject Uh, there's a hadith which is from Muslim Abu Daud uh, Nasai as well as in Tirmizi in which it said uh, describing the virtues that anyone who memorizes the 10 ayahs from the beginning of Surah Kahf uh, it will protect him from the fitna of Dajjal so it's a great idea a uh, very simple ayahs to remember and recall if you read them a couple of times you'll be able to recall them so to to learn the first 10 ayahs at least and then obviously go on and if you can learn the entire Surah Kahf that would be extremely nice Uh, in another hadith which is from Muslim Ahmad, uh, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, for one who reads the first ten and the last ten ayahs of Surah Kahaf, there is a nur from his head to his toe and for one who reads the complete Surah, uh, the nur is from heavens and the earth. So, reading the Surah is uh, always a good idea, you will get lots of nur. In another hadith which is, uh, you know, uh, from the book of um, Hakim, uh, from the book of Hakim actually, uh, and it is recorded by Abu Saad bin Khudzi Razialano, and he said whoever recites uh, Surah Kahaf on a Friday, it will illuminate him with the light from one Friday to the other. So uh, this is what it's going to be, and if you will see the central theme for Surah Kahaf, it's about don't be deluded by the glitter of this world. This is a very temporary world, it is a, it's a glamorous world, no doubt. Uh, it's, there is a lot of power, there is a lot of position, there is a lot of beauty. Uh, but there are certain things which are obvious and then certain things which are apparent. But don't get deluded by that. That's a central theme over here. We're going to be looking at four different trials that are described in Surah Kahaf. The trial of the faith, uh, that will be the story of the seven sleepers. That's the first one that we will be looking at. Then the trial of the fitna for wealth, which will be, we will look at the story of two men uh, and one of them was given two garden then we look at this uh, the, the fitna of knowledge and the fitna of knowledge is the is the story of hazrat musa alayhi salam and hazrat khizr alayhi salam so both of them we look at that and lastly we'll also look at the the trial or the fitna of power and we'll see zulkarnay and the story of zulkarnay so lots of great stories coming in over here and we are going to be looking so let's just look at the first ayah uh, which is uh, of surah kahf bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillah allazi anzala ala abdihi kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja praise belongs to allah who sent down the book to his servant and has not placed in it any crookedness so this ayah the first ayah it really makes clear over here that uh, there is no mistake in this book there is no error in this book the message of this book from the very first word to the last word is very consistent and for those people who develop a deep relationship and a bond with this book it will lead it will help them to lead a straight and a balanced life a life which is being devoid of crookedness a straight forward book to warn of severe punishment from from him and to give the good news to the believers 
who do righteous deeds that they shall have an excellent reward which means the reward of paradise so the to the believers and the doers of good deed i think you can see from here this ayat the very positive reinforcement of the great times that lie ahead over here you will have a good life also and then you will have an excellent reward in the hereafter in which they will abide forever and to warn those who have said that allah has taken a son while they have no knowledge about it nor had their fathers dreadful is the word that comes from their mouth they say nothing but a lie so o prophet perhaps you will kill yourself out of grief over their footstep over their footsteps sorry soaring after them if they do not believe in this narration now you can see over here that sometimes when we think that about prophets and people of faith and people who have who are connected with allah that they will not feel the grief you can see over from this ayah that even our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a grief not just a grief but a grief which quran says perhaps you will kill yourself out of grief so i think the message over here is we all need to understand we need to give ourselves permission to be humans we are all human beings we will have grief we will have disappointments we will have delusions we will have all sorts of things that any other human being faces even the prophet face face that even our prophet sallam was uh, sad at some sometimes he was grieved at this so this aya actually highlights the 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 feelings and the emotions and the kind of uh, disappointment that our prophet sallam must have felt at that time because he was clearly sincerely calling people to the right path but people were not changing and sometimes you get this under confidence you know you feel that is is my word doesn't carry any weight is there no asar in my word why people are not changing why people continue to deny why people continue to abuse and persecute as the prophet said you know is 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 mentioned in this ayah inna ja'alna ma ala al ard zinatan laha li nabluhum ayyuhum ahsanu amala and surely we have made what is in this earth a beautification for it and so so that we test we so that we test them as to whom among them is best in deeds so why is this earth being beautified why is this earth being decorated why is it made so alluring uh, for, for and tempting for people this is a kind of an exam right the more beautiful this earth is the tougher the test is for people and it is for people to use their intelligence and their foresight and to protect themselves from the temptation and the lures of this world because what really happens is this world is such a beautiful and a comfortable place that you begin to start feeling that this is my permanent home so this is a warning for those people who invest themselves only in this world and nothing for the hereafter well then they are really invested investing in the ship which is going to sink and surely we are going to turn whatever is on it into a barren land ام ام حسبت ان اصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من اياتنا عجبا and do you think that the people of Ka- of kahf which mean the people of the cave and the raqim raqim means an inscription so do you think that people of the cave and inscription were a wonder among our signs so now we're going to begin with the story of seven sleepers now as to where these caves are where this kahf uh, is uh, some people say well it's in turkey you know there is a whole place called fss we went to see that but uh, that it's in turkey some say it's in jordan others say it's in iraq it really doesn't matter wherever it is what is important for us is to really understand the moral of this story and take the lessons from the story now this is a story about uh, of people of the cave these were seven young christian men whose faith was in danger and that time christians were the muslims of that time and their faith was in danger and as a result they took protection into the cave so that's the story we are going to be talking about from now till the next few hours when the young man took refuge in the cave and said our lord bless us with mercy from yourself and facilitate for us our affairs in the right way now this is something that you can see in these young men these seven young men that this is what makes people unwavering and steadfast trust and expectation only on allah trust is not on material trust is not on people they are looking up they are looking up to the soul power they are not looking to the left and to the right now these young men left uh, the life of luxury the life of great comfort tremendous wealth with friends and protection and why did they do that just to protect their faith as we will see in the subsequent eyes uh, you know coming over here now for us what do we need to think about this figure out 
for our own self, what are we willing to sacrifice for our faith? You know, it's, it's, we need to really think about this because even if we don't sacrifice, whatever Allah has given us in this life, uh, ultimately it's all going to be taken away. It's just a matter of time. It's like, you know, you're playing a game of Monopoly. I don't know if you've played a game of Monopoly. When the game ends, you hand back everything that you have amassed during this game. And that's exactly how this life is. You earn, you make things, you make a house, you have lots of wealth, but then it becomes all zero for you the moment you leave this world. The moment the game ends, it's all staying over here. So we patted upon their ears in the caves, in the cave for a number of years. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing his mercy that when somebody is passing through this huge emotional trauma, the nerves get tired as the nerves of these seven young men must have become tired. And as a result, sleep overtakes them. This is a kind of a defense mechanism. And you know, when we are in deep sleep, we also stop hearing. So Allah put these men to sleep in a deep sleep, so to take away the great trauma and the emotion that they, were, they had gone through. So this is the first rahmat of Allah in form of a peaceful sleep. No fret, no threat, no worry, no anxiety. Thereafter, we raise them up so that we know which of them, which of the two groups had better calculated the time period in which they remained. We narrate to you their story with truth. They were young men who believed in their Lord and we increased them in guidance. So this story is not being just uh, narrated to us for passing time, but it has a purpose. There is a wisdom behind it. There are moral lessons which we must draw. We made their hearts firm when they stood up and said, our Lord, is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We shall never invoke any God other than him, otherwise we would be saying something far from the truth. So now this is a speech that this young man must have given before they went and hid in, in these caves. And this speech was made in front of the king, the king of that city. Uh, and that must have been a very powerful city. And so, and, and, and certainly they were not the Muslims, the city, the king was not a Muslim, all the people were not Muslim. But you can look at the very steady faith that these people, that these young men have. You know, they, their hearts became very firm when they stood up and they said, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. These people of ours have taken gods, gods beside him. Why do they not bring a clear proof in their favor? So who is more unjust than the one who fabricates a lie against Allah? When you have turned away from them and those whom they have, whom they worship except Allah, then seek refuge in the cave and your Rabb will spread for you his mercy and provide you ease in the matter. Provide you ease in the matter. What is the ease in the cave? Allah is saying that you turn, you, you know, after you finish you, 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 for your worship, you go into the cave and you, Allah will provide ease for you. Who will provide comfort in the cave? There are no servants, no furniture, no food, no nothing. So the comfort that Allah is mentioning over here, the ease that Allah is mentioning over here, is that they will be able to worship Allah without any opposition, without any fear. You will see the sun when it rose turning away from their cave towards the right, and when it set, it bypassed them towards the left, and they were lying in a wide space. That is among the signs of Allah, and he whom Allah guides to the to the, is rightful is rightfully guided, and him and whom he sends astray, for him you will find no guardian to lead him. Now the location of this cave, as this ayat describes over here, was such that the sun rays uh, would not come directly in, but the warmth would be filtered in just to maintain the temperature. And you would think they were awake while they were asleep. We turned them on their side, right and left, and their dog had its forelegs stretched at the entrance. Had you happened upon them, you would certainly have turned back in flight, and you would surely be filled with awe. So Allah made the best arrangement for them in this cave, turning them from side to side just to make sure their blood keeps circulating, preventing sores, the bed sores that are there. Now sleep is, uh, in, in sleep also when we look at our daily sleep, when we sleep at night, it's such a natural, in a natural way we also turn. At times we cannot take care of uh, ourselves because we are in a deep sleep, but Allah takes care of us by turning us as Allah did for these people. In this way we raised them up until they asked each other, one of them said, how long have, have you stayed? 
They said a day or a part of a day. They said, Your Rub knows best how long you have stayed. So send one of you with this silver coins of yours to the city and let him look around which of the eatables are purest and let him bring some food, uh, let him bring you some food. And he must act in a polite manner and must not let anyone know about you. So after a long time, as we will see how long, 300 years, these, these uh, young Christians were raised again. They got up from this leave. By this time, the town had changed. You know, they, everyone had become, Christianity had become the, the religion of that, of that city or the town. So everything had changed. But they now, they, were, they didn't know about this. So they sent somebody to get some food uh, for, for, you know, with the silver. If they, the, which means the inhabitants of the city will know about you, they will stone you to death or force you to revert to your faith and in that case you will never find success. In this way we disclose their affairs so that they realize that Allah's promise is true and that there is no doubt about the hour, which means the hour of resurrection. When they were disputing among themselves in their matter, they said erect a building over them, their Lord knows best about them said those who prevailed in their matter, we will certainly make a mosque over them. So, to cut a long story short, they were discovered when they presented these coins, people came to know that these people have been sleeping for uh, 300 years or more, and so therefore they came back to the cave, these, these young men also came back to the cave, they probably died over there, and when they, when they died, they were buried inside the cave. Now you can see the standard mentality of the people of the of this city. Although they had converted, they had become Christians, but they wanted to make a place of worship over there. Like, you know, every time we see, we make a monument, we make a kind of a shrine over here. And, and we do this by, after ignoring the moral lesson, the stand of, on Tawheed that these, these young men had taken. That lesson is forgotten. And then people actually make all these rituals over there. They will have an horse over there. They will make some, you know, big grave over there. They'll come for, for, uh, for you know, for asking Allah, to, you know, over there, asking these pious people. They'll begin to worship these people over there. And that's been a standard mentality of people for a long period of time. Some will say there were three, the fourth of them being their dog. And some will say five and the sixth of them being their dog just a conjuncture. Others will say seven and eight of them being their dog. Say my Lord knows best about their number. No one knows them except a few. So do not debate concerning them, except with clear proof, nor consult anyone concerning them. So don't debate. This is a message that Quran is giving over here. Don't debate about these irrational issues. Whether they were three, they were five, they were six, they were seven, whether the dog was the seventh or the dog was the eighth, doesn't matter. These are irrelevant issues. The essence will be lost. If people actually continue to debate about this, the essence of the whole story will be lost. And as a result, when people actually dispute this, different sects come into existence. And never say about anything, I will do this tomorrow. Illa an yasha Allah waskur rabbaka iza nasita wa kul asa an yahdi ani rabbi li akraba min haza rashada. Unless you say if Allah wills and remember your Rabb when you forget and say it may be that my Rabb will guide me to a better way than this. So a little background to these two ayahs over here. Uh, our Prophet ﷺ was once asked a question by some people and he replied that I will tell you tomorrow because Hazrat Jibreel would visit our Prophet nearly every day and uh, our Prophet expected the answer from Allah. But then for the next two weeks, uh, the Hazrat Jibreel didn't come, there were no revelations and our Prophet felt very awkward and embarrassed because people came to him every day for the answer. And finally these instructions came and these instructions were that do not say such and such except that if Allah wills. So we may plan we may say we will do this tomorrow, but uh, this, these are just plans. Allah, unless Allah permits, our plans will never materialize. So the moral of this ayat is whenever we say something that this is what I'm going to do, always in the end say inshallah after this. And be convinced that the results are only in the hands of Allah. Because future is unknown to us. Allah holds the key for the future. They stayed in their caves for 300 years and some add nine. 
Say Allah knows best how long they stayed. To him belongs the unseen of the heavens and the earth. How well he sees and how, he, how well he hears. And they have no supporter other than him. And, and he lets no one share his authority. So Quran wants us, uh, wants that our concern should not be on numbers, it should not be on figures, but it should be on the moral lesson. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord and there is no one to change his word and you will never find a refuge besides him. Now, if we don't want to change, the law of Allah will certainly not change. There is a punishment for sin and there will always be a punishment for sin. Only by conforming to the commandments we can actually come close to the mercy and to the grace of Allah. Keep yourself content with those who call their Lord morning and evening seeking his pleasure and let not your eyes overlook them seeking the splendor of the worldly life. And do not obey the one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance and who has followed his lust and whose behavior has exceeded limits. So the instruction that are being given over here to all of us I think is so important for us to understand is that we, you know, we must be with those people who call their rub. This highlights the importance of good company. How is our mahal? How is our environment? Our environment is so important. For iman to prosper, conducive conditions are vital. It's like you may have a very healthy plant you, and it must be in the most uh, you know, fertile soil and you give it the appropriate amount of water but if you put it in a dark room, a room in which there is no light, no matter how good or healthy the plant is, no matter how good the water is and the fertilizer is, the plant is going to wither away. Similarly, if we are in company of people whose heart is full uh, with noor, the light of our hearts will also begin to glow. And if we are in the company of people whose hearts are darkened and gloomy, then certainly our hearts will also be, will also be impacted and will lose the noor. It's like if we sit in a room which is filled with smoke, uh, we will reek of smoke. Even if we are not smoking, our clothes will actually reek of smoke. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَافَ الْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَافَ الْيَكْفُرْ And say, the truth has come from your Lord. Now whoever so wills may believe and whoever so wills may deny. Surely we have prepared for the unjust a fire whose tent will envelop them. And if they will beg for help, they shall not be they, they shall be helped with water like molten brass, which will scor which will scale their face, and evil is the drink, and evil is the resting place. Now this actually ayat is so important to see that in the first part of this ayat it says, and say the truth has come from your Lord. Now whoever wills he may believe, and whoever wills he may deny it. It's the call is yours. People are free to make their, you know, make their choice. They can actually believe in it, they can actually deny it. And that's why there is a punishment and this, that's why there is a reward. This is the truth. The truth has come and this is best for us. And sometimes we, you know, sometimes we don't really fully understand. Sometimes we really need patience uh, for, uh, for these things to sink inside us. Verily, as for those who believe and did righteous deeds, we do not waste the reward of the one who does good deeds. Those are the ones for whom there are eternal gardens, rivers flowing beneath them. They will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold, and they will be dressed in green garments made of fine silk and thick silk, reclining therein on coaches. Excellent is the reward, and exceptional is the resting place. And now we're going to start with the next uh, story, which is the story of these two men, which is the fitna of wealth. وَزْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَسَلَ الرَّجُلَيْنِ جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِ هِمَا جَنَّتَيْنِ مِنْ آنَابٍ وَحَفَفْنَا هُمَا مِنْ نَخْلٍ وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَا هُمَا زَارَا And give them an example of two men. We gave one of them two gardens of grapes and surrounded both of them with date palms and placed vegetation between them. So you can see from this ayah that Allah had blessed one of those, out of those two men, Allah had blessed one of them and description of a, some very well-off person, prosperous, wealthy, lot to be pleased with, excellent quality of life. But I think we shouldn't really form an opinion. We need to hold on and see because the end will be very different. 
one of the men one of the man has two gardens and his friend has none so on the face it seems that the one with two gardens is better off he's the one who's successful he's the one whom allah has blessed because he's thriving he's prosperous he's wealthy but by the time the story ends we will discover that the one who didn't have anything actually he turns out to be a winner so what we realize is that what is visible may not be the reality everything is a trial sometimes allah tries people by giving them and sometimes allah tries people by taking away from them the true success is the end result it's the protection of faith both the gardens brought forth their fruit and suppressed nothing from it and we caused a river to gush forth in the middle of both and he had wealth so he said to his companion while conversing with him i am greater than you in wealth and stronger in manpower so you see the fitna of wealth taking its you know full toll over here i am rich i am powerful i am greater in superiority now this is actually these words are actually describing the inner condition of that man now he has reached to this conclusion that he is rich and powerful after thinking about it after comparing making his comparison with his friend he is using the wealth his wealth in order to dominate in order to intimidate his friend he has no consideration and sympathy for the other person he is just patting his own back i am so superior that i have achieved what others could not achieve others are really good for nothing the thought doesn't even cross his mind that this whatever blessings that he has is basically because of the rahmat of allah this is the mercy of allah that he has all these blessing so he entered so he entered his garden while he was unjust to himself he said i do not think that this will ever perish and i do not think that the hour which is the day of judgment has has to come and even if i am sent back to my lord i will surely find a better place than this resort this is the mindset so this is the mindset of the one who has who, you know for whom this world has is like a jannat he is lost in the maze of this world and he thinks that this this party will never end this is going to be there forever his companion said his companion said as he was conversing with him do you deny him who created you from dust and then from a drop and then fashioned you into a man so this disbelief and doubt about the resurrection about life after death that's what this his poor friend is challenging him as for me i believe that allah is my lord and i do not associate anyone with my lord now now think about your own self i mean we need to think to apply the side to our own self and think about if we were poor and we had a friend a class fellow of ours who had been studying with us all along and he had actually reached high powerful position very rich what would our reaction be quite honestly i think we would feel deprived we would feel left out oh our friend has everything we started the same we were in the same school he has everything how lucky he is that sense of deprivation will come and you'll curse the unf- unfairness of this world how can this world be unfair to me why is this world been so so kind to him and not to me now just because someone has everything doesn't mean that allah is happy or unhappy with him now what you also would have noted over here that that while the friend uh, is poor he he doesn't have any rancor he doesn't have any bitterness he has no complex why because he is grateful he is thankful he is and that's the basic building block of a sound personality that he is thankful that he was insignificant dust and then allah gave him life so he is even thankful for the life that has been given to him remember that whatever we have whatever we have it's not our right we have not earned it this is a mercy of allah this is a favor of allah that we have been given whatever we have been given so if someone is rich and has little faith we should never never envy such people remember that the greatest treasure the greatest treasure is the treasure of faith and the treasure of iman walaula is walaula is dakhalta jannata ka kulta ma sha allah la quwata illa billah and when why when you entered your garden did you not say everything is as allah's will kulta ma sha allah this is this is allah's will illa la quwata la quwata illa billah there is no power except except with allah now how sympathetic this this friend is reminding his rich friend 
he's very sympathetic. He's not saying, oh, what a silly man you are. You don't you know that you're going to die and leave everything behind? The friend realizes that his, his uh, rich friend doesn't have the treasure of Iman. Now, also important for us is that this, uh, uh, this ayat that makes it very clear over here, that it tells us two, two things that must be there on our, on our lips all the time. MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. These are the two things. The Allah's name must be on our lips. The more Allah gives us, the more humble we must become. Modesty must reflect in our behavior. We must say, MashaAllah, when you enter into your home and you see a nice home, you must say, MashaAllah. When you see your spouse and you like your spouse, always say, MashaAllah. If you like your children, say, MashaAllah. It's, whenever you see a pleasing sight, say, MashaAllah. With every nimat, we must remember Allah. Because this helps us to come closer to Him. When we say, Inshallah, when we say, MashaAllah, when we say, uh, you know, La quwata illa billah, this is all helping us coming close to our Creator. We are returning th whatever names that we are giving, we are being thankful to Him. So if you are rich and have the best in this world, say Alhamdulillah for that. Feel responsible. Do not let your wealth and prosperity make you heedless and, uh, and make you ungrateful. Fasa Rabbi Yutiani Khairam min Jannatika wa Yursila Alaiha Husbanam Mina Samai Fatuspeha Saidan Zalaka. And then it may be that your Lord will give, you, give me what is better than your garden and will, and will send to it punishment from the heavens and it will become a barren land. On what basis is he making this claim? This poor friend, on what basis is he making this claim? He says, Fa Asa. For Asa Rabbi, it may be, I hope so, it may be, I hope. He has an expectation. Now recall earlier, his rich friend, what he, what he said, La Ajedanna, La Ajedanna, I will most certainly get something better in the hereafter. I will most certainly get. While his, his friend is making, you know, saying completely differently. He says, you know, he's saying, I hope, I pray, I expect that Allah is, is giving. So the poor friend is really claiming on basis of his good deeds and on basis of his strong faith. Or its water will sink deep in the earth so that you will never be able to search it out. So asking his, what he's, this, this poor friend is telling his friend is to invest where he is investing. Build faith. Give wealth in order to build your faith. Why would anyone just keep investing in a company that they know is going to go, you know, go, go burst, where it's going to go into liquidation? And its produce was overwhelmed by calamity and he began to wring his hands over what he had invested in it while it lay fallen down on its roof. And he was saying, I wish I had not ascribed any partner to my Lord. So all the fruits of the labor, the wealth, everything that his garden were, all of it was gone because he had put all his trust on this. All, all the trust was put on onto this garden and, and that was gone. All the garden was not completely destroyed. Now he, he, in the end he says, I wish I had not ascribed any partner to my Lord. Where is the shirk here? Where is the shirk? He never said, I worship a moon god or the deity gave it to me. What partner? What type of shirk is this? What is the type of shirk he is reflecting over here? This is a shirk of tawakkal, the shirk of trust, that you have reliance on your own ability. My own ability I will be able to earn. My wealth will be able to save me in my retirement. The material, the self, it's the medicine that has cured me. It's not the medicine that cured you. It is Allah who put that cure in that medicine. I think that's where we need to understand. It's not the doctors who cure us. It's not the medicines that cure us or protect us. It is Allah who protects and cure, cures us. And that's something we need to keep remember that it is not my ability. It's not the well that is going to save any one of us. It is only your trust and your tawakkal and your reliance and your dependence should be only on Allah. There were no supporters for him besides Allah who could come to his help, nor was he able to defend himself. So, you know, when things go bad, when you lose your position, when people lose their wealth, everyone around them also do the vanishing act. They just disappeared. No friends, 
no friends of a person but they were friends of his of his wealth and his position now this is a very painful thing and don't think that it's only this man the rich man who is, who experienced it at that time this is experienced by people today every day people who are in high position and when they retire from these high positions and then all these invitations that were coming to them while they were in this you know big and mighty on sitting on a big and a mighty chair all these invitations cease to come and suddenly after the retirement life becomes so lonely now that's the time you need allah you really need allah you need allah all the time and you really need to have a relationship a strong relationship with him otherwise life after retirement can become extremely lo lonely make allah your friend because he will provide you with the true friends who will be able to give you company when you need this company the most that is where the power of protection rests with allah the true god he is the best in rewarding and and best in consequences wazrib lahum masal al hayat al dunya kama in anzalnahu min as samai fa akhtalata bihi nabat al ard fa asba hashiman tazruh riha wa kana allah ala kulli shay'in muqtadira and coined for them a simile about the life of this world it is like water we send down from the sky then the vegetation of the earth was mingled with it and then it turned into shaft which allah which, which the wind scatter and allah has power over all things such a powerful ayat you know the first time i i heard this ayat was somewhere around in 1991 92 and i had gone to a a, a funeral and by, at that time i really have wasn't so much conversant with the quran and uh, this funeral was for the father of a you know a person who was a very dear person and he uh, gave us khutbah in the in the in the graveyard and he recited this ayat you know i i really uh, couldn't really understand and then i came back at home and i and i looked at this ayat and i can i mean i still find so much of um, you know passion about this particular ayat because of the you know situation that i heard this ayat but this ayat is actually telling you the simile or uh, or the life of uh, uh, of 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 everything that lives it's portrayed like water falling down from the sky and with rain the dead earth comes alive and then there is life all around it the vegetation the plants the greenery the foliage foliage that grows with it there's hustle there's bustle there's hum there's buzz and the dead field of yesterday gives away to a very picturesque and a, such an attractive sight you can see this after every long summer you know we are we live in a place we have a big plot in front of our house which is which is just barren throughout the year and suddenly after the summer rains it becomes so vibrant it's blooming it's like these lively days will never come to an end there are all sorts of flowers over there but then soon the summer would turn the flowers into dry stuff and then the winds would scatter them here and there now when you read this one single aya it's like you have passed through your entire life in a haste in a very swift and a hasty manner no longer this field will be a beautiful sight the flowers will wilt they will be sag they will be drooping and finally they become lifeless they will return back to the earth from where they came after mixing with the earth then there is no distinction no difference between different flowers it could have been a rose it could have been a periwinkle it could have been a daffodil no matter what that flower was once it is you know mixed with the earth it's all dust and such is a life of man such is a life of man because this is a final moment of going back onto this earth that none can desire none can actually deny al mal wal banun zinatul hayat ad dunya wal baqiyat us salihat khairun inda rabbika sawabum wa khairun amala and wealth and children are ornaments of the life of the worldly life and everlasting good deeds are better with your lord both in reward and better in respect of hopes so wealth and children yes definitely they beautify the life they adorn this life they make it uh, they make it very beautiful but this is just like a facade of a of a home the facade or the front it may be very ex exquisite even without or ornamentation even without an or, uh, you know facade a home can equally be comfortable and happy and a restful place the more we decorate the more strenuous and tiring it is to maintain I think you all have gone to parties and put on these well adorned clothes beautiful clothes but they are not the most comfortable to wear you say oh my god the moment you come back from the party you just want to take them off and put on something light and nice 
and the same is true for things that everything that makes things beautiful is not really something which may be very comfortable people may decorate the grave of someone who is dead it will have no effect on the comfort of one who is inside the grave man's comfort lies only in good deeds it's only his comfort is in good if he have to put some hope if we want to put some hope quran says that if you want to the, and everlasting good deeds are better with your lord both in terms of reward and better in respect of hope so if you want to put your you know hope anywhere put it in your righteous actions so let us decorate our good deeds let's decorate our good deeds like we decorate recreate our home and our living you know that's that's the moral over here it's something that we need if you want to rely on something we need to rely on our good deeds that we have done and the day when the and the day when we will make the mountains move and you will see the earth fully exposed and we shall gather them together so as not to leave them out a single one of them and they shall be presented lined up before your lord it will be said to them now indeed you have come to us just as we created you for the first time while you claim that we would not make any appointed time for you can you imagine this i just think this i said and they will be presented lined up before your lord there will be a day when your name will be called everyone name will be called one by one and each one of us we will be standing in front of allah all alone are we really ready for that have we done something which we will which we will be able to rely upon do we have enough good deeds for for this day that when we will be standing in front of allah and the book of deeds will be placed then you will see the criminals fearing what is in it saying woe to us what is the, what what a book this is it has missed nothing minor or major but has taken it into account thus we sh- thus they shall find whatever they did present before them and your lord did not wrong anyone every day of our life that we live every day we turn a page of our life every day is a page of our life our own personal autobiography is being written by us every word that we are saying we are dictating it is being written down every good deeds that we do is written down instantly and the sin that we do the angels wait if people ask for forgiveness and their sin is forgiven then that is not written so please remember it's our autobiography is being written down by what we are saying and what we are doing and it better be a good it better be a good book recall when we said to the angels prostrate yourself before adam so they prostrated themselves all of them but iblis he was of the jinn so he rebelled against the commandment of his lord do you still take him and his progenious friend instead of me while they are your, while they are enemy to you what an evil exchange it is for the wrong doers now here is uh, is uh, quran actually mentioning that iblis was a jinn it says all of them but iblis and he was of a jinn so he was a jinn in the court of allah i did not make them witness to the creation of heavens and the earth nor of their own creation nor is it for me to take those who lead others astray as helper as helpers recall the day when he will he will say call my partners whom you claim to be my associate so they will call them but they will not respond to them and we shall put a put a gulf of doom between them so those people who make angels or prophets or aliya or righteous people as their associates or people who are dead and buried in their grave as their associate when people will call them actually they will feel annoyed because no one will want that allah should question them the sinners will see the fire so they will know that they will that that they will not they will have to fall into it and they will not and they will find no way to bypass it indeed we have explained in this quran every subject in various ways for the benefit of people but out of all creation man is the most disputing so like uh, the quran has given the same example uh, you know many different ways so that people can benefit it's like when we want to explain our address to our, of our house to different people we give them different directions right so different people with the diff, you know people get uh, you know people of different uh, will get faith by looking some people get faith by looking at the signs in nature other people will get faith 
by by the fear of Allah. Other people may have their faith, you know, strengthened by looking at the history, by studying history. And it's some people it's it's through their hearts, and for other people it is through their mind. Now this is a book for people of all temperaments, of all attitudes. Hence, it has various examples being provided in it. The only thing that prevented people from believing even after guidance had come to them and from seeking forgiveness from their Lord is their demand that what used to come to the earlier people should come to them as well or that the punishment should visit them face to face. We send the messengers only as a bearer of good tidings and warners and those who disbelieve raise dispute on basis of false argument so that they may refute the truth with it and they have taken my signs and the warning given to them as mockery. Who is more unjust than the one who, who, who was reminded through the signs of his Lord but he turned away from them and forgot what his own hands had, had sent ahead. Indeed, we have put covers, cover, covers on their hearts and barred them from, from uh, understanding it. And we have created deafness in their ears. And if you call them to guidance, even then they will never adopt the right way. Your Lord is most forgiving, the Lord of mercy. He, if he seizes them for what they did, he would have hastened the punishment. But there is an appointed time for them from which they can never find a place of refuge. These are the towns that we destroyed when they acted unjustly and we, have and we had appointed a time for their destruction. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَحُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَمْزِعَ حُقُبَ And recall when Moses said to his boy servant, I shall not give up until I reach the junction of two seas or else I shall go on traveling for years. So now we're going to look at the third story and we're going to do part of this uh, this evening. This is the story of Hazrat Musa salam, and Hazrat Khizr. Hazrat Khizr salam, was also a human being. He too was a prophet. And this story is about the fitna of knowledge. So when they reached the meeting point of two seas, they forgot their fish and it made its way into the sea as in a tunnel. When they went further, he said to his servant, bring us our morning meal. We have suffered fatigue in this journey of ours. So Hazrat Musa salam, has undertaken this journey and he has undertaken this journey in order to get knowledge. Remember, knowledge is never easy. One has to really struggle and strive and this is jihad. It's never easy to acquire knowledge. One has to, uh, to, uh, to withstand hunger and one has to withstand fatigue as Hazrat Musa salam, is enduring over here. He said, we have suffered fatigue in this journey of ours. He said, you see, when we stayed at the rock, I forgot the fish. Now, this is the servant saying, I forgot the fish. It was none but the shaitan who made me forget to tell you about it. And it made its way in, in the, into the sea in a strange way. So shaitan sometimes put obstacle in paths of righteous people to make them irritated, to make them frustrated. So don't let these small setbacks discourage us. These setbacks should not really discourage us that we give up. So again, interesting thing over here is that uh, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, his servant, uh, said that I forgot to tell you this, this uh, the, the meal that you had uh, given to me. But Hazrat Musa doesn't shout as his servant how irresponsible you are. What a kind of a servant and irresponsible person you are that you let my lunch swim away in the sea. He said, that was what we were looking for. So this is Hazrat Musa saying, that's what we were looking for. So they returned retracing their steps. Then they found one of our servant, of one of our servants whom we blessed with mercy from us and whom we gave knowledge, a knowledge from ourselves. Qala lahu Musa hal attabeoka Allah. And Moses said to him, May I follow you so that you, you teach me some of the rightful knowledge you have been taught. Look at the adab of, of over here, Hazrat Musa salam asking. The manners, the etiquettes of acquiring beneficial knowledge. Hazrat Musa salam was a messenger of Allah. Not just a messenger, he spoke with Allah. But look how he speaks with modesty, with respect, because he recognizes that Hazrat Khidr he is a teacher. 
if he wants to gain knowledge so if we want to gain knowledge if we want to gain beneficial knowledge a knowledge which creates peace in us then we must be respectful to our teachers he said you can never bear with me patiently so this is a khizr's response he said you can never bear with me patiently and how can you be patient over something which you cannot comprehend so the reason why he will he is unable to be patient is because the knowledge that khizr has a knowledge of future is not the knowledge that has been given to hazrat musa alaihi salam hazrat musa alaihi salam has been given knowledge he has been given the torah he has been given uh, many different knowledges of that allah had given to him about sharia and about guidance but he has no knowledge of the future and khizr has knowledge of future and that's the real difference that you can see over here he moses said you will find me patient if allah wills i will, i shall not disobey any of your order so the last ayat which is ayat number 70 of this evening qala fa imit tabatani fala tasalni an shayin hatta uhdisa laka minhu zikra he said well if you follow me do not ask me about anything unless i myself start telling you about it so this last act as we will continue on inshallah on the next session over here i told us 71 onward you will see over here this is the fitna of knowledge the trial of knowledge we look at the apparent we look at things that are visible to us and we draw conclusions then conclusions with allah are very different sometimes things are, are are difficult for us but in the end the results are very different and we will see when we conclude this ayat that our opinion about the events of this world things that happen around us may be very different our perceptions may be very different but reality in the end will be very different so barakallahu lana wa lakum fil qur'an al-azim wa nafa'na wa iyyakum bil ayati wa zikrillah